So yeah, so I'm uh, a PhD student at the moment uh, working at CERN. So here in uh, the Geneva area uh, in Switzerland, France. So, and I'm working in the microelectronics section that we do have, um, that is somehow in the experimental uh, physics department of, of CERN. So we are essentially building the chips that support uh, the experiments, for example, for the LHC and so on. So we do things on, uh, on the detectors, on, on sensors, on front ends, uh, but also the, let's say the, the plumbing stuff, doing the, the actual data transmission. Uh, so I, in, in particular, uh, work on uh, data transmission circuits in general, let's say. So our group builds data aggregators, uh, high-speed links, uh, so transceivers and optical uh, modules for those and so on. Uh, but we also do lots of other stuff like uh, DC-DC converters uh, to power all those uh, circuits we build and so on. Um, so yeah, the, the, the work is, is relatively broad and I guess we are, as a, as a section working on microelectronics, not really organized like the, the typical industry style setting uh, of this type of work is. Um, that might might be also because we also have always have to deal with this special requirement of making all the electronics we build uh, not only work, but also radiation tolerant, mm -hmm. uh, meaning they can withstand the, the large doses of, of uh, radiation they will uh, experience when in, in the experiments. Mm -hmm. And this is quite a challenge which always requires looking down to the last last detail for everyone in the chain. So the just abstracting all of the details away for any given designer is not really an option. Yeah, I guess um, we'll, we'll, we'll see, hopefully discuss some of the challenges about that, about when we get into uh, like, yeah, some of the stuff you did or something. All right, yeah. Um, so yeah, do you, do you have like a, a thing that you worked on that you can talk about in more detail? Because like you, when you talk a very broad, you know, oh yeah. yeah, I did, I did some, but if, if you have specific examples, usually more easy to. Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, I mean, in, in principle, the work that we do and, and what we work on is, is anyways free to share. So there's mm -hmm. no, we, we don't need to keep trade secrets, uh, at least not in terms of what designs we do uh, yeah, that helps. Uh, or, or how they function. Right. Um, so I, I, for my PhD, I do work on all digital uh, phase locked loops. Um, so essentially trying to bring the domain of PLLs, which is, let's say, traditionally more an analog uh, domain where you build lots of analog components, charge pumps and RC filters and uh, oscillators that are tunable by analog voltages and so on. You mm -hmm. try to bring all of those in, in a digital domain and essentially try to build a frequency synthesizer that is, they say, all digital, but of course that is rarely true. So it's, let's say, heavily digital. Mm -hmm. um, so the, and I mean, this is a, a common thing in, in industry for many years, probably any, any given cell phone today has at least a couple of, of all digital PLLs in, inside, um, just because the going to, let's say smaller technology nodes that these uh, phones typically use, they just require that because the analog performance just goes bad quickly. Right. Um, so, but in, in the context of, of our, let's say higher energy physics, accelerator technologies, mm -hmm. uh, this hasn't really been studied before. But there's quite a few, a few points that, uh, let's say, give the impression that it should have a couple of, of positive benefits for radiation tolerance as well, uh, especially when we think about how to systematically harden such a design, um, because it's conceptually easier to grasp how to make a, a digital design radiation tolerant and can be done and say in a more structured way. Um, so, and this is why I'm, I'm studying. So essentially for the, let's say the, the main, uh, let's say chip design or tape out for the PhD I did was essentially building a, a test chip demonstrating a, an all digital PL uh, that is uh, radiation tolerant and uh, could in principle be applied in, in these sorts of environments we are normally targeting. So it's mm -hmm. a kind of a demonstrator project. Um, but of course around that, there was uh, a lot of issues, not only on the design of that, but also then on on verifying performance of, of frequency synthesizers in general in these sorts of environments and so on. Mm -hmm. So, but this is the, let's say the, the field that I'm mostly concerned in. And then of course I'm involved in, uh, let's say a project of the, the group itself. So we are in, in, in my group also working on a, let's say, or the, the, the people I closely work together with, they currently are designing a, um, like a data aggregator chip, which essentially takes many medium speed signals from like front ends and detectors and aggregates them into one high speed optical link um, and has a couple of other peripherals. Uh, and so this chip is uh, close uh, close to the, the tape out deadline. Um, so we'll, we'll also be finished in a second iteration very soon. 
okay. and this is a let's say a, a bigger project that's that's going on that will essentially power all the experiments that will be uh, used in the future LHC upgrade. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So to perhaps give a a little more context of the the designs so of the essentially this move to to making the designs I, I do more let's say digital heavy uh, always comes also with the with the challenge or let's say the special challenge about is that it's not they are let's say the the, the size of these designs in terms of number of, of instances reaches a point where it's not trivial or possible anymore to really exhaustively simulate them using a simulator such as spice like mm -hmm. a, a net like a transistor level simulation um, but of course, just doing a, a purely digital, like Verilog type simulation also doesn't really cut it for most of the parts when you are mm. really yeah. interested in the, the analog performance, because in the end you're building a, a PLL and you expect some like jitter performance um, and lots of, of other, let's say, analog type performance numbers that you need to get out. And so this mm -hmm. is a, a space that I found an interesting to explore, um, but also not the most easy because the, the tools, I mean, be they commercial or, or open or and any sort of tools don't really are not yet really catered for this sort of close interaction between digital and analog. So this has been a challenge in, in modeling and properly partitioning uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course you uh, see the, the, or find the limitations of, of certain tools relatively easily. <laughs> or yeah, so you have to sort of set up complex mixed signal simulations with uh, partly digital, partly analog and uh... Exactly. Yeah. So this okay. is the type of, of thing you do, or you. I, it, it also starts much earlier in, in the in the process. So this is something I I had to learn the hard way. Let's say that it is crucial to know from the get go how to usefully partition your de your design. So you will be able to simulate all the the critical parts that will determine your I don't know your performance of your synthesizer in the end, mm -hmm. um, in a way that they are potentially built or or implemented in the let's say the custom analog type of design world. Um, and then just integrate those into your digital design where you will do all your, uh, let's say, let's say loop filters and, and things that are, uh, that will cause a, a large number of instances, which will essentially not contribute to the, the performance in an analog way so much. So, and of course, this is something that is a, a learning experience and there is no, no golden bullet, essentially nobody tells you how to properly do that. So it's mm -hmm. something, so, and, and this is also part of the, the process we're, we're going through here. So the idea is not only to figure out how good these digital PLLs will be in terms of radiation, but also of course, figuring out what the best design methodology for them is. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how do you go about it? Like I assume you, you start out just doing some literature review and then you decide, okay, I want to build this one. And then you just open cadence to start the, what, what, or, uh, <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, yeah, so it, it, it goes a bit, bit bit deeper than that. So um, I, I mean, essentially, of course, the first step is in any case, literature review, which I, we, we come, we have this, this advantage, uh, even though we are, let's say, always in the, in the research uh, type, type of work area, um, that essentially we are not building new stuff let's say conceptually, as I said, mm -hmm. like all digital PLLs is a topic that books have been written about. Um, so you're not reinventing the wheel at least. Um, so of course you go through literature and look for the concepts that people have implemented and you are relatively quick to decide on the architecture that you will need, let's say, to solve your given problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so the, the first thing I, I started doing was really doing kind of system level simulation. So I essentially I built like a, a systems simulator, like a simple event driven thing that completely decoupled from any hardware implementation, really just plugged in numbers for, I don't know, what tuning range does my oscillator have? How finely can I tune it? Uh, mm -hmm. What sort of noise does my input have? And try to model all these things and build a kind of a, an abstract model of the, the circuit you're then trying to build. And then when you're, when you're sure that the parameters you've chosen make sense and give you the will give you the performance you will need uh, then is the point where we actually start implementing those and then of course it comes down to also figuring out can you actually reach like those performance numbers for each of the components mm -hmm. so of course you can find what an, an example specification for this for this digital type of PLLs is for example how like the tuning step size of your oscillator right so imagine you will have a, an oscillator in such a PLL that you don't tune with a voltage so continuously but it has discrete frequency steps. Mm -hmm. Of course, how finely you can, let's say, tune this oscillator in terms of step size will determine the, the performance of your PLL. And then you can, of course, come up with a number that you want to have, uh, but then actually implementing, let's, a very fine granularity 
might be a, a whole different challenge. So then of course you do uh, an iteration and see, okay, I can, and it's probably not feasible to reach this sort of uh, tuning precision or tuning step size. Mm -hmm. uh, so I need to go back and change something about either the architecture or the way I implement my design. And do you so, do just like system level stuff in like, I don't know, MATLAB or like uh, F8 VHDL or something like, how do you go yeah, about so, that? Yeah, so I mean, probably the, the I, I don't know, five years ago, I probably would have done it in, in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. um, but these days I essentially abandon MATLAB and just do it in Python. Mm, okay. Even that it's basically the, the replacement. But essentially, I mean, in, in hindsight, probably with the, I mean, that was two years ago. Uh, so essentially the, uh, probably now I would consider doing it even in, in VHDL or Verilog mm. uh, because essentially what I ended up doing for this type, type of thing as you're essentially simulating a digital design, um, I would probably just go with an, let's say event driven uh, simulator in the first place. And I mean, of course, it doesn't matter. You don't need, need to simulate hardware in, in VHDL or Verilog. Um, but could model abstract design components. And I've seen people do that. So probably nowadays I would rather do that. Um, I was hoping to have a, a bit more flexibility in the beginning, um, going with a Python solution where you also have simple access to all sorts of maths and signal processing functionality. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a, a balance to be stricken. And of course, if you end up implementing your own simulator loop in the end, and that consumes most of the time, you might be better off using a simulator that already exists and dumping a few files and post-processing them. Yeah. So, but yeah, so I mean, that is a, a probably a whole field of, of how to properly approach this, but it was a, a learning exercise. And yeah, it's so what, it, what it resulted in wasn't, wasn't so bad. Of course, I mean, runtime could be better and you're not, won't be running the longest simulations with a Python simulator. Um, I'm not sure it, it does the job. So probably mm -hmm. many ways to get you to the, the goal you want to get to. So they, uh, so they, then you start to build the actual thing and do you, because, so it's fully digital, right? So do you actually just like write like in HDL or, or do you also like design the more analog, like analogish parts, uh, like in an analog spice thing or? Yeah. Uh, yeah another very interesting aspect about this uh, this type of PLL. So uh, of course the, the, let's say the, the gold standard or I mean, what you are trying to get to is something that you com can completely synthesize. So the, the dream PLL mm -hmm. would be a bunch of Verilog files or VHDL files for that matter that you put through a synthesizer and you end up with a, a PLL and an ideal you, you have three parameters that you can give like performance numbers to and end up with a fully parameterizable design. But of course, I mean, reality is not that simple <laughs> as we, I know, so, so we, we, we tried to also find out, or I, I looked at a couple of, of aspects of this um, because there's many things you can try to synthesize and just do, let's say automatic place and route to get to a, a reasonable design. But you'll also quickly realize that by doing that in some of the corners, you do just sacrifice performance, right? Because a, a custom design where you, let's say individually hand treat every transistor uh, is just faster and and will give better performance than something that's automatically synthesized in probably the majority of cases. So in the end, it, it comes down to identifying what the critical components are. And for me, I, or in, in my experience, that was I'm surely the, the oscillator. So the oscillator in the end for uh, the three types of PLLs I've, I've built and, and have in my test chip is are like fully custom designed. Um, yeah, which essentially means you are building kind of small standard cell like structures in an analog design environment, but make sure their placement is very regular. Uh, so you have good linearity of your tuning. Um, you take care that all the routing is matched so that you have, uh, for example, in a, in a ring oscillator where you have multiple stages, you make sure that all the, uh, the wire length of, or, and all the loading on all the nodes is uh, equal and so on to make sure the, the linearity of the oscillator is good. And also you kind of need to do that if you ever want to see how good your oscillator is, you will somehow at some point need to, to put it in a spy simulator to get an idea of what phase noise it produces and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So while well, there have been, I mean, on the other hand, if for less demanding applications, so I've, I've seen some, some papers from people that just build synthesizer for like microcontrollers and they actually just have a, like a flow to, let's say automatically place and route a given oscillator from Verilog and oh, okay. a couple of specifications. So we can go both ways, but as we are, or as, as, as the designs or the, let's say the future applications in, in high energy physics kind of all look towards getting higher precision and timing mm -hmm. um, that dictates somehow also quite quite stringent requirements for the synthesizers we built. So it is it was, yeah, essentially I don't see a way 
around still doing, let's say, analogish custom design and simulations for this type of, of experiment. Yeah, but in the end, so uh, when you when you figure that out, so essentially there is a, also a big portion of this design that is really just automatically plays and routed and really is fully synthesized only from the like from Verilog code. Right. Um, so and like the, you, this so this oscillator is kind of like a semi-analog thing, and then how how, like, how does that become radiation harder? Do you just like put several next to each other and then add them uh, up or? Yeah, so again, there's there's just so many options to explore there, and and this is the the big next step that you you always need to keep in mind here in in our environment. Mm -hmm. um, that while of course you can easily just decide for any given architecture that will probably work because somebody else had, has made them work, but you always need to take a look at uh, or also have in, in the back of your head how does this how would this hold up under radiation, and this and comes down to for and there, there's first of all different types of, of radiation effects you're looking for. So essentially mm -hmm. broadly classified as the single event effects, which which you can like, imagine as a, a bit flip or like your oscillator suddenly changing its phase, like having a, a big phase jump uh, because mm -hmm. a, a single, for example, a heavy ion strikes a sensitive uh, junction somewhere like in the transistor. Yeah. Um, and the other ones would be the total ionizing dose effects or really effects that uh, accumulate over the, the years of, of operation. Um, where really just uh, you you see a, a trend of all the transistors in your design, for example, becoming like fifty percent slower or something like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and and fifty percent might be on the low side for some of the the, the the designs we're we're targeting. So. Okay, so it's just it's like normally you just have, you know simulate some corners, but now you also have to simulate some very 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 extreme. Exactly. Yeah, and corners. we do that by by different by different means. So and and of course, so this. So then it, it really already drives what, what kind of oscillator, for example, you build, right? So mm -hmm. like given, so if you're looking at a blank state, your first choice would be kind of, do I want to build a ring oscillator that is essentially made from a, a ring of inverters, like from transistors, or do I want to build like an LC kind of oscillator that has like a, an inductor and a capacitor? Mm -hmm. And then you look at, okay, how, how is the radiation sensitivity of those two parts? You, you know, the transistors, they might become like 50% slower after three years of, of operation. And you know that essentially an inductor and a capacitor, they are like passive metal and, a, and a, uh, like a, an oxide in between. So they are not going to degrade very heavily. So mm. probably the stability of your frequency over total dose will be much better with the LC oscillator. So that is right. kind of the first uh, architectural uh, or decision you can make. So for um, we still decided to, to do both because ring oscillators also have their advantages. They are much smaller, for example. Mm. Um, and there's, of course, applications that and where you can just live with the, the somewhat worse performance they deliver. Um, but okay, then you also start, okay, now I need to think about how big do I make each individual transistor uh, to make it work even after uh, a heavy degradation. So you need right. to, so you either use different simulation corners, as you said. So we have some specialized models uh, where they recharacterize all the transistors for how fast are they after so and so much irradiation. Uh, so you have to um, exercise it. Like, you know, normally, I assume you just get a PDK, but you have to like, like a, a special model that you like internally made for this, or exactly. So I mean, internally is a, a bit of a wider term in this case. So the let's say there's some people in the community of, of high energy physics that really focus on the radiation effects in mm -hmm. in transistors, let's say, or in silicon technologies, and they really get, go through the effort and develop test structures, put them under like a, an X-ray radiation machine, and then really extract new models for all the transistors after a certain level of, uh, of irradiation. Wow. <laughs> but I, uh, that, that, the, the problem with that is that is, this, I mean, there's just so many things that can, can go wrong when doing this exercise, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, all these, how, how badly a transistor degrades depends heavily on in, in what type of circuit it is, what type of voltages it sees at these terminals and so on. So yeah. these models also just give you a, a starting point. So sometimes yes. it also comes just down to doing conservative design and saying, okay, I mm -hmm to develop for the worst corner that my foundry provides uh, and add on top of that a margin of, I don't know, 50%, 30%, whatever you think is reasonable. So, and, but we, luckily we have quite a bit of comparison data by now. So a lot of people have mm -hmm. built chips and measured them and characterized how they degrade under irradiation. So you know that a typical digital design will get lower by so and so much after so and so much dose, right? So. Yeah, but it, it certainly just broadens the, the simulation space. And nowadays with the technologies we are operating in, you're anyways simulating, let's say 
tens of, of corners already in a in a in an analog simulation. So we're talking about like twenty ish corners we we look at mm -hmm. to make sure like for to sign to sign of a design. Um, but of course, if you add this on top of that, then you can can quickly like explode also the number of cases you just need to look at and it yeah. broadens the, the the resilience your design needs to have to all sorts of variation yeah, yeah so i'm just like thinking okay so you, you're you know you normally have like fast slow and then the, the resistors and the capacitors so that's like you know two times two times two, exactly two, two to the four like i don't know it's already 16 or something and then now you have right uh, <laughs> like 10 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent degradation and then yeah. yeah it becomes like two to the sixth or whatever is eight and then exactly yeah, you can yeah and i mean that. and in this sense i'm i'm somewhat lucky doing only digital design mm. right so this becomes much more problematic if you are actually building like sensitive analog electronics that have i don't know an, an analog front end amplifier or something like that that has to have linearity over a, a, a certain range and so on so essentially luckily the, the main observable in this sort of the design I'm, I'm looking at is like I, I control a couple of digital input bits and I need to con let's say make sure the frequency is stays in the the expected range for the expected time um, so this to some extent makes the problem tractable and, and and as many problems come down to really making them or uh, let's say breaking them down far enough to to make them tractable in simulations because otherwise you you'll never get anything done Hmm. So how do you set up the simulation? Like, okay, so you have, you have your digital model and your analog model. Um, and, and, and you, you, I think we like you assume like you use like commercial tools. So like, how how do you set up a simulation like that, and how do you run it? Or yeah, so okay, so this um, so uh, it, it it again is it depends on on choosing the right tools for for the right simulation. So the for let's say the when designing these these only the custom parts like for example in, uh, as we we stay with this oscillator example uh, so in this case the the whole design is essentially done in an analog design environment uh, of a commercial tool uh, and then you also do the simulations there so we essentially run a, a spice simulator um, which knows about all your analog tidbits you know those transistor models and corners and voltages and so on mm -hmm. um, and then of, of course, I already mentioned that it's not feasible most of the time to then take the full digital thing you implemented, like the whole PLL, and simulate it as well in a SPICE simulator. So typically, or the way, the way I went there, and what is probably typically done in this case, uh, also from discussions with other people, is that you try to, from your analog simulations, you extract a couple of models. Uh, you essentially say, okay, this will be a relevant corner, like the fastest possible and the slowest possible case, mm -hmm. potentially after irradiation. Uh, you essentially extract the, the tuning curve of the oscillator or some other important parameter and essentially do a simple Verilog model for that that abstracts mm -hmm. away all the transistor workings and rise times and stuff mm -hmm. uh, and essentially build a, a simple only a, a timing model let's say if i put this input code on the oscillator it will oscillate at this frequency and then you plug that into your Verilog simulations which essentially contain yeah all the to say the, the very log part of your design mm -hmm. and then simulate there and then that gives you if you if you do it right of course <laughs> that gives you uh, a good indication of first of all if your design works uh, if, if let's say the, the design you build works and also can give you quite a bit of information about the uh, the performance it will have i mean of course you will not get uh, a beautiful phase noise plot for all and can decompose that into all its uh, constituents mm -hmm. as you would in, a, in an analog simulation but it's as close as you can get and if you are careful and design the custom parts carefully enough and simulate them independently uh, then you have relatively high certainty that if you plug them all together uh, in a simulation um, that it will also work and then so what i tried doing as a let's say final sign of step because i mean it was just not feasible to simulate the whole design on a gate level Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even talk about the chip level um, as in a, let's say, spice or kind of mixed mode simulation. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been experimenting a bit with this new uh, type of simulator that are like, called uh, automatic partitioning, okay. uh, which essentially can determine to some extent. So they realize, okay, if your design contains so and so many standard cells uh, that essentially just connect digital to digital blocks. Um, so I probably don't need to simulate uh, like a spice netlist for this. But so they more or less automatically figure that out. And then they say, okay, here's the boundary where you connect to some, let's say, spice level block. Um, so here I will do a, a more precise simulation. 
Um, but essentially, I was really only able to do this as a like a final sanity check to make sure that all your the the connection between your custom design blocks and the digital logic is correct. So then, yeah. And as a as a final step, you really want to at least once make sure that if you spin up the design and put it in a in a halfway reasonable state, mm -hmm. uh, and in 24 hours of simulation time, you can figure out if it will correctly lock, for example, in in the the, right. the case of a PLL. So, yeah. But it's really something that then really explodes in, in runtime because you're talking about hundreds of thousands of instances. Yeah, so you wrote a few nanoseconds maybe and then uh... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So and for me it was um, on the on the level of microseconds. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So and and for that you really already have to make sure the like everything is preset in a way that that it locks instantly able... basically. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you give it some some startup help and of course it's a process of figuring out these settings and mm -hmm. automating that somewhat. But it gives you this final bit of confidence because the the, the major and a major difficulty is still the interfacing between, let's say, custom design analog blocks and integrating them into something digital. Um, and already here we are talking about hundreds of pins on the interface between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. you start to have, I and mean, you have to make sure that all these interfaces are okay, that the rise times on each of the signal that crosses the boundaries is what you expect yeah. um, and have to essentially figure out what the, the load on the analog side is and have to tell that the digital tools and also have to tell the digital tools how fast you want your rise times on these pins to be and so on. Um, and this is I'm not a very straightforward process at the moment because you I essentially deal with archaic file formats all the time uh, that are hard to inspect and debug. And there's some tools, that, of course, that automate part of this process, um, but the, the verification is, is also not trivial there. Yeah. So and it was this was this final simulation? It was still sort of mixed, right? Or was it fully like spice? Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I experimented also. I mean, you can just tell the simulator just don't do this partitioning. You do everything spice. Oh, okay, uh, but but then... I, I was never able to get into. I, probably you could wait a week and run it on the machine that has <laughs> uh, more cores that you could afford for your home PC. Home PC. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then then also the the results are questionable, and you run into so many problems with just initial conditions of your simulation, essentially yeah. having to initialize many nodes in your design that you first have to figure out. And it's, it's a long process. Probably it would be done in a, in a setting where you actually have the resources to do that. Um, but I guess if you make sure to properly partition your design beforehand mm -hmm. and making sure you can simulate the critical parts also in an isolated fashion, rather than just as a one big block that you have to simulate mono monolithically, um, you run pretty good chances. So I mean, this modeling of the oscillator, for example, is, is critical to really run many Verilog simulations with just RTL code um, yeah. to actually figure out how your your the system you build behaves and if it it does what you expect it to. Because um, you I, it, building only the this this core part might be a, a relatively small thing. So the actual loop filter is also I, I, the whole core of the PLL is like a hundred lines of Verilog probably. Um, but of course, you have lots of associated logic all around that. You have like a control, like I square C interface. Um, you have like some automated calibration procedures and so on. And um, these take long time in, in just reality because they have long counters that measure frequencies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so all this, and it will never be feasible to simulate on the, let's say, on a chip level with a spy simulator. And it will also mm -hmm. not be very useful because you yeah, essentially don't control. learn. Thing. Exactly. You don't learn anything that a very log simulation wouldn't have also told you together with like a standard static timing analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so it comes down to, and this was, as I said, a, a learning experience tr from the get-go partitioning your design in a way that facilitates doing that so that you can take later on, if you do want to do a, the, the final closed loop simulation um, with this simulator, you just take the, can rip out the piece that's critical where you need to know it works and put that into the simulator and doesn't make it choke. Mm -hmm. essentially yeah and i'm of course there's no I, I haven't found any golden rules on how to do that so it really first of all seems to require experience so that is the the sad truth there was no nowhere i could i could read up how to do that of course the, the best thing you can always do is and i i did uh, i'm in the lucky position to have a lot of uh, colleagues that are much more experienced than i am mm -hmm. so it was always good to just have a chat with them and ask them how would you approach this problem and you know yeah. nobody had yet designed exactly the same thing I did. They, of course, have, have had lots of experiences with do, setting up these sorts of simulations, knowing how to partitioning a design uh, just by <laughs> probably doing the, the mistakes earlier themselves, right? That you otherwise mm -hmm. would run into. Yeah, it's always yeah. always great to have experienced people to 
ask around. Right. Yeah. But I mean, coming from a, I mean, I'm originally also coming more from a digital design background. So I'm, I did lots of FPGA stuff before mm -hmm. coming here and working on microelectronics. And, and I, I always was in this mindset of it, it must be possible to simulate everything together and at once and have one consistent simulation, which tells you the ground truth for everything. Um, and I found that to be feasible in, in FPGA world all the time, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I never reached a point there where I, could, where I couldn't run like a, a gate level simulation and it, it would take days to complete and I, I wouldn't find it feasible to run it. Um, but here I, it, it is uh, and for, for many types of problems, um, when you do, do have to go down to the, the transistor level, um, you quickly realize that this type of modeling is, is really key to, to success at some point. Yeah, and this was probably yeah, one of the the biggest learning exercises I had to go through to mm -hmm. accept this reality. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm just thinking of uh, thinking of other things to ask or to like. I didn't prepare any like this no, questions I mean... or anything. It's just. Uh... <laughs> could could go on with with other things um, yeah i mean yeah we could oh. talk about like some other aspect of like we talked about simulation a lot now yeah uh maybe yeah i'm also kind of i'm, I'm kind, of kind of curious like sort of the the challenges you run into with the layout mm -hmm. uh because okay assume it's not as simple as you just do you run a place a route and you throw some transistors and it's done yeah, so I mean, this this again, we can we, we can approach this from from two sides. So let's maybe start with the the one where I have less things to say. Uh, so the I, I of course didn't do. So if we talk about layout, you could think either of doing the actual layout in a, in a custom analog design type of environment. So where mm -hmm. you literally place things on the transistor level. And of did I I luckily didn't didn't do so much. I mean, of course my uh, my designs, my, my, my the oscillators I designed are custom analog type of designs as mentioned mm -hmm. um, but i tried in the in the sake of or for the sake of making them behave properly uh, to make the layout as as regular as possible um, so the design is essentially like a, a kind of unit cell design so it has many many small constituents which are essentially just regularly placed and then routed um, so it's by no means automatic but the the effort to do was was manageable mm, so you um, sort of make make your oscillator like a standard cell and then just run place and route in the whole no, no, so no, so I, I was not able to do that. So, but yeah. essentially, I, I I manually assembled. So I built like a small kind of unit cell for the oscillator, mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I had to instantiate and regularly uh, align like hundreds of those. Um, mm. So it was a, a, a process that could have been automated, let's say, even in in an analog um, design type of environment. Um, but yeah, so it, it was not a, a an automatic place and route exercise. Um, so and for the other parts, I mean, I guess it's it's standard, uh, or let's say layout practices that, that just are becoming more and more difficult in, in the kind of small nodes we are we are working in. So um, the problem always becomes that the parasitic start dominating your performance. So um, it is maybe this this is interesting, starting not only from the layout but um, also that I mean we also uh, started. Uh, no, so let me. Where, where was I? What I wanted to say. Uh, ah, so yeah. So essentially, it does, there's no no point in in, in setting up a, a pure schematic simulation, and then figuring out your how or, or seeing how great your design is and and going for the layout instantly, um, but taking like at this step already taking getting some feeling or taking some guesses and what what type of parasitics could add what nodes in your design might be let's say very sensitive to additional loading for example by wiring interconnect um, and like putting those in already in a schematic level simulation will tell you really quickly if your design is anyways feasible because mm -hmm. otherwise you will end up essentially building a beautiful layout for the the circuit you designed in the schematic um, then actually layouting it and, and the, there's always this additional loop of then doing the extraction where you extract all the the wire load parasitics uh, and uh, like capacitance of each wire to ground and to other wires and the resistance mm -hmm. that all the inter interconnect has, which is significant in, in cases. Uh, and then rerunning your simulation after this process and figuring out, okay, now my design is like 50% slower. Mm -hmm. uh, so I need to start from scratch because now it doesn't meet any specifications anymore. 
Um, so it, uh, yeah, so this is a uh, another thing. So you already include a lot of parasitics, like manually, like. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, to... the, the trick typically seems to be not to add many, but only add the important ones. And of Key course, places. without, <laughs> wait, yeah, exactly. But without, I, I, I am not, I wasn't able to to do that from the get go, of course, because I, without any experience, you have no good bearing on on knowing that, and it is something you have to see once with your own eyes to actually learn, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, for me, I, it, it turned out so. I, I, I did run some simulations, and I was disappointed with the result of my layout. Um, but uh, so, of course, then after you do that, you have to figure out. Okay, and there's some ways to inspect, let's say, the, the extracted parasitics, even though it's a very typically a, a large convoluted mess of a net list that you have to sift through and, and find out what the actual capacitor that's causing a problem is. Mm -hmm. um, but then what you typically or what you try to do is then already go back to your uh, schematic level simulation that is really simple and add a, sim a simple capacitor and sometimes in the one specific place where it needs to be, where you know, okay, this will have some loading in the application because it needs to route, I don't know, 300 microns to another place in the design. Mm -hmm. um, and you add that and then you see, okay, now my design is so much slower. And uh, now I can anticipate and go back and I don't know, re uh, dimension my transistors to make them slightly faster yeah. or optimize some other place of the design. Or uh, if you identified you have some big piece of capacitance here because of something, you can go and fix that something, right? Um, so it is a, a two-way process. So it's not not even just the, the classical feedback loop. So it's also all, uh, has like a, a feed forward component where you learn from your experience and then of course know how to avoid it when you actually do the next lay layout you do. You, yeah. you know how to avoid problems much better that you otherwise just wouldn't have foreseen. Um, and then it, it also comes down probably to knowing your technology really well. So something that is also, it's, it's hard to get into a new, I, I imagine new technology node um, just because the, the relationship of things changes, right? So something you have might, might have an intuitive feeling uh, for if I place this, I don't know, width and length of metal on this specific layer, it will cause so and so much capacitance. Mm -hmm. um, is something you first have to gain in a kind of intuition for. Um, yeah. And of course, if you, you approach a design without knowing that, um, you can sift through hundreds of pages of documentation that will probably tell you this number. Um, but the, the learning is so much faster if you <laughs> have a bad, bad experience once. So, yeah. Yeah, but this makes the, the layout process in, in the, the custom world these days so difficult. So it's not only the, the fact that in general, analog performance of transistors is getting worse and worse, um, but also the interconnect parasitics are becoming much, much larger. Yeah. Um, so to, to the point where, yeah, I, essentially everybody's trying to do only the things that are necessary in analog and shift what can be done into digital where the tools can essentially, they, they, they don't need this intuition because they, they have programs to, to do this, right? So uh, mm -hmm. essentially, and that's the other aspect we can talk about is the, the digital place and role, which you can also call layout, of course, because uh, it essentially also, uh, it means placing and, and doing routing. Yeah. Um, and so the, the tools nowadays, they are need, all need to be, and they all are aware um, of, of these sorts of effects, right? So they know mm -hmm. that if I will place two standard cells this far apart, I will need so much routing between them. And then of course it will know that if I do that, I will need to put a wire there that has that much capacitance and this will slow down my design so much. So I will better not do that, but place them in a different way. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem with that, that we often run into, so I, this is, goes, goes into the direction of why can't we build a PLL that we can just synthesize from Verilog, mm -hmm. um, is that th these tools then, of course, they, they often struggle with um, making, or I mean, you struggle actually declaring your intent clearly enough, right? So this, this tool, for example, if you, you want to build a design, so take, take my oscillator as an example that constitutes of, let's say 500 unit cells, uh, you will not be able to convince the design to automatically place those in a very linear and regular fashion um, that has matched parasitics between each of the, the different cells. Yeah. Uh, it will just not do that. It will place them more or less semi-randomly because it uses some sort of mathematical optimization to minimize the length between mm -hmm. all the nodes. Um, and if you actually want to make it placed in a way you you want to, then you have to put put effort and tell the tools that, and then also tell it not to touch what you have done, yeah. uh, because they are also quick to just neg or negate all the effort you put by just placing like a, a cell somewhere in your design that you didn't even specify to be there, mm -hmm. um, and that ruins your day then. So, 
Um, so yeah, it is kind of the, the type of design is some is a design that you would ideally like to do in a digital design environment. Um, mm -hmm. From the the design, I mean, it's much easier to write a Verilog file instantiating 500 buffers than write, paste copy copy and pasting a schematic that does it um, to the the full layout. But then there's there's just not not yet the or let's say I I wouldn't think that the tools can yet really do that in a way that is feels satisfactory to me to really mm -hmm. do a kind of custom design in a digital scriptable workflow. Uh, so this is something I would would look forward to to see improvements on, let's say. Uh, but yeah. as it stands, we, we have to make do what we have, right? And I mean, the, 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 surely also the, the tools are not made for that typically, right? So the what they, they look at, they look at uh, like seas of, of millions of gates and where there's just no room to look at each individual buffer or each individual say they sell they place. Mm -hmm. they, they just need to make sure they are good enough on the average. Yeah. And let's say pull out as much performance as possible out of a, a typical design. Um, but then as soon as you get into doing small dedicated areas that you have to manually pay attention to, uh, then you have to, then it's down to you telling the tool exactly what to do and what not to, and being very careful that it doesn't do anything. You, mm -hmm. you, you told it not to, not to stop. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. This is interesting. So, so and uh, for us, maybe that's uh, just an, another small point to add here is that for us, um, the, 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 the low or the, the, the smaller in technology nodes we go in our environment where radiation is a, a, a concern. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, let's say additional challenges on all the, the placement, even in the, the digital automated parts, uh, because we, I mean, if you have to, to think that essentially now our cells are on the order of single microns in size, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you imagine that, that ionizing radiation uh, can simply hit anywhere in your circuit, these days it's not even unlikely that it can affect multiple cells that are placed close to one another um, mm -hmm. at the same time, right? So you might imagine, so a lot of designs in the digital domain that we do, we protect using uh, triple modular redundancy, right? essentially meaning you triplicate you put every part of your design three times, mm -hmm. um, but then and that's only half the, the business. So if the you, other half if is they're close awesome. together. You can just like trigger all of them at the same time. Exactly, and, that's, <laughs> and we, we have seen that in, in the past. And there's ongoing effort to even characterize how feasible that is, what kind of distances you need to keep, and so on. Um, and and then I mean, this is the first part: figuring out that you have a problem there, but then also convincing the tool to actually respect this. Because of course, I mean, for yeah. for the, for any sort of tool the naive thing or the, the, the logical thing is to place everything as close <laughs> together because then it will be fastest. Yeah. Um, so we also, I mean, we have to take a bit of a performance hit in our designs, of course, um, because we have to do all these things, right? So we can't build the, the latest bleeding edge and probably the fastest uh, given any given technology can offer mm -hmm. just because you have to, to sacrifice something to, to the protection against, against single event effects in this case, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you sort of simulate the, like the like the resilience to radiation because you, like you mentioned the degradation for the analog part mm -hmm. yeah yeah right. so for so, so this we do for for both digital and analog so mm -hmm. essentially we can you can use the these transistor models that we have for the degradation yeah um also to extract new timing libraries for your digital standard cells so and essentially you get a new simulation library that just has slower delays for everything mm -hmm. Um, but of course, that doesn't really tell you anything about the single event effects right. that were mentioned before. So there, um, we typically, and you, you try to do a lot of things by, correct by construction, of course. So you try to do a design that is free from these sort of problems by designing it that way. But of course, verifying that you haven't screwed up. And, and in our case, also that the tools haven't, uh, again, uh, did a did some bad things to you. So I mean, we also see that the tools, of course, they are essentially logic optimizers. And if you place uh, the, the same logic three times next to one another. Oh, it's the same, they can remove two. Right, they, they will just merge them. Um, so you also need to take care to also properly constrain your design in a way to tell it, do not optimize or touch anything uh, that is that concerns the redundancy, but please still do optimize all the logic in the sense that it can be, can be fast, as fast as it can be. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that the, that we are correct and that the tool didn't do anything, so you also have to do simulations. So we essentially uh, we do fault injection simulations. So this typically then again happens on on a very log simulation level, where we really take the essentially the, the netlist or the, the very log design that comes out of the the place and route tool, um, and essentially get a, a, a list of all the 
the gates or all the cells and say, okay, is this cell sensitive to a transient or to a, an upset? I mean, any flip-flop could just be upset, could change its state, mm -hmm. while any combinatorial gate could just have a short glitch at its output. And then we just build like a, a wrapper around the simulation that has a, a loop and does that. So it randomizes where it in, injects errors and when it does that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's essentially the process. But of course, this, as you may imagine, if you look at the design and the designs we do, they they might easily have a, a cell count in the hundred thousands or millions. Right. Um, and then if you need to simulate a, a couple hundred uh, of injected arrows in each of those cells, um, then I, you know you can imagine that the simulation time increases rather rapidly, and you right. also need to somehow observe that something in your uh, circuit was was wrong, so you need to have a, a proper verification environment that can co even catch unexpected events mm -hmm. of this type, right? Because and it's uh, your your logic can essentially behave completely erratically. I mean, it's not even so you wouldn't probably catch all the possible failure cases with just a normal type of functional verification you could do, um, because you and there's just so many and the, the state space is just wide and so much given that not only the things that your design intent contains can happen but also many things that you just cannot anticipate otherwise mm -hmm. so you also need to make sure that when you do a simulation um, you also make sure to catch all possible failure modes and cases and this I, goes goes through many levels right it's, it's the test bench code you write it's also the features of the simulator you use to, for example, I produce X, like a, a, an invalid uh, state in a simulation whenever there's a timing violation and to make sure that all of those are flushed out cleanly and so on. Um, so this is a, a wide reaching effort. And then, and of course, at some point, if you are confident that, that what you simulate should be safe, mm -hmm. um, we, have, we also have the option to then get it fabricated and put it through a test, right? So we can go to various irradiation facilities here in Europe uh, and essentially mm, okay. put the thing in a controlled particle beam where you can, <laughs> where, where, that you can turn on and off in a controlled manner and that yeah. will give you a, a given number of particles per second uh, and, and from which you can estimate, okay, if I put my chip in and it keeps working for an hour, I'm pretty sure I did not too many things wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I, that, is, that is oversimplifying, but um, this is the, the, the process we go through. And I mean, it, we typically end up with, I mean, th these sorts of things are very, very tricky to get right the first time. Um, so, I, and that re probably reflects in the way we, we do and plan our projects as well, right? So it's, it, it is always anticipated that something, we will discover something unexpected because essentially every design does something new, does something that hasn't been explored in the radiation domain before. Mm -hmm. um, so you always have to also run like an actual validation campaign after you get your chip manufactured and check if what you simulated not only conforms to the performance specifications, but also to the radiation tolerance specifications mm -hmm. again just I mean, it's just broadening the the search space and the the, the, the possible state of, of problems in every right. domain yeah so that and that is what what probably is the the special thing and makes our designs so much more complicated even though they're most of the time so much more simple than commercial counterparts you would see so i mean you wouldn't will not find uh, us building like a, a crazy uh, cpu for for an lhc experiment because the we just need to build things that are simpler uh, because we also need to be sure to verify them right and yeah and any i mean anything that is very complex also doesn't i mean it's, it's not possible to just verify with the small amount of, of manpower and then validate anyways in a in a setting like in, in an actual experiment so given the, the level of confidence we need to have to make it work is yeah, somehow limits also what you can do in terms of design size and and uh, let's say Mm -hmm. avant-gardeness <laughs> yeah 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 so and yeah so yeah we talked a bit about like different uh simulation things you did and you mean yeah, you mentioned the single single upset you mentioned that you do like for the, the phase uh thing like what, what other types of simulations do you do to verify the performance of your design mm, other types of simulations also, I, I guess it. I, these are the, 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 so I mean, of course, in in, in analog, you do all sorts of uh, of simulations that are, that concern also uh, the, of course, all all the specifications you have. Essentially, you need to somehow simulate in in an analog way, like the uh, power consumption and all all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I wouldn't be. 
No, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that we do any major other things. So as you mentioned, we do some, some things sometimes when it's necessary with like mixed mode setups, where you have a part of the design that is actually done by a, a Verilog simulator while the rest of the design is in a, an analog fashion. And this we typically do to verify the, really the, the boundaries from the, the digital to the analog. Mm -hmm. um, where you need to take care to properly say, okay, the, the rise time on the signal that will cross over to the analog domain boundary is so fast or so slow, um, or where you might have different supply voltages on either side on the digital or the analog part. Um, another thing that is somehow not, not yet very well covered, um, but we, we need to look at a lot, um, is also the design for um, yeah, let's say analog type of effects in digital circuits. So I, I mentioned we are building a lot of uh, circuits that do like things like clock distribution, or essentially like a high precision clock uh, that has, let's say, high performance requirements, traverses through a, a block of automatically placed and routed logic. And what tends to happen is that all those your digital standard cells, um, they of course they have some modulation from the activity that is happening around them on the power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So imagine that when, when there's a lot of activity going on around, you will have periodic dips on your power supply voltage uh, that your, for example, your clock buffer sees. And this will, of course, modulate the traversal time of the clock. Right. Mm -hmm. So and this is a, a problem that we now frequently run into when we look at really the timing precision of clocks, uh, where you need to really make sure that the power integrity is, is maintained. So uh, and that's probably another domain of, of simulations we do. Uh, since since recently, let's say, so we really also do need to do a, a full power analysis on on our designs, and it's not only power in terms of maximum power consumption, mm -hmm. um, but also let's say the, the the drop in any given place on the layout. So you want to know what is the minimum supply voltage I have anywhere, um, because having let's say a lower static supply voltage will reduce your timing margins, so your design will become slower. And if you have this sort of periodic dips. Um, then you might have might run into problems with, for example, the, the, the quality of the output signals you generate. Mm. And the other aspect is also electromigration. So I'm not sure if that is something that's probably not very uh, familiar, where essentially the currents that flow, um, so and you can imagine like very large peaks of current when uh, something in your design switches, they actually mm -hmm. uh, cause parts of the metal in your interconnect to migrate away, to physically move uh, <laughs> from one place to another, um, mm -hmm. just because they are dragged along uh, by the flow of current, if you will. Um, and, and of course, the, the foundries give you a, a number of, or many numbers for if your piece of metal on this layer is so-and-so thick, you can at maximum have this sort of current density there. Um, and so this is something that also a, a domain of simulation that you need to do if you build uh, complex designs in small nodes, where you, you really need to make sure that you keep, stay inside those limits. Um, so this is typically not a concern for like you power it on and then it fails the second after, but it's really a long-term reliability issue. Mm, so we, we probably you could neglect that for a simple prototype chip, but for anything that is going into a like longer term operation and where okay. you expect to be on the border of, of the specifications perhaps, because your design needs to be very dense or, or for, for other reasons. Um, then you will also carefully need to evaluate that. And that is then something that is typically not done with a, a, a SPICE simulator in the first place, um, but is a kind of co-simulation where first there's a step that evaluates what current profile and what RMS current will I have where on in the design, mm -hmm. and then annotates that onto your layout, checks what is the metal thickness there or the, the, the width that you have of, of your power delivery stripes, and then okay. actually checks those limits. So it's kind of a, an add-on step onto all of that. But there's there's tools that automate this part at least, so you will essentially end up with a, a color map that tells you, okay, this part of your design is is red, which means you have to do something to reduce the current to get more power there or mm -hmm. add add more I don't know more power distribution. Make that... the trace thicker or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So then then there you have to so but getting getting to the awareness of where the problem is mm -hmm. is kind of the first step for that. Yeah, but there's power integrity analysis tools both for the the digital domain and also for the custom or analog design world. Okay. So, but that's yeah, more it, like it, it, it just estimates sort of the power from various things. It doesn't run a spice simulation. It just sort of. It, it, it depends. So there's, so in the digital domains, I think the, the inf so there, the, the power analysis tools run on activity information. So one thing you can do is just load mm -hmm. like a VCD file from a simulation run. 
um, and essentially tell it to annotate. And then it will know, okay, at this point in time, this given cell will consume this much power because it is switching. So essentially the timing uh, and power libraries also contain information, how much power will be drawn when an output of a gate is switching, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is done in the digital domain. Um, and is of course, a, let's say more coarse grained, I would say. Uh, while there's also in the, in the custom or analog design world, you will actually run a spy simulation and let's say dump the, the current profile on every node. Yeah. Uh, and then the tool post process that and, and checks against the limits. Yeah. So all, both can be done. And again, it comes down to choosing your, your fighter and <laughs> getting the, the right results, right? So making sure that probably for a digital design, you can need to be more conservative because the numbers might be underestimated. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to choosing also what is my worst case simulation conditions, which is always tricky. So is it when I'm at the highest supply voltages, when my transistors are the fastest, at what temperature and so on. Um, so this is some, and this is the part of the simulation where you need to take the actual care um, and make sure, okay, this is probably reasonably overestimating any sort of worst case I can have in an actual operation. Um, yeah, well, then the, the running of the simulation is the, the automated part and you don't have to do the, the let's say the, the handiwork of, of, of doing the post-processing, um, but getting the setup right, because there's no one to tell you if you, if you did it wrong, right? So if you just use the wrong corner for your simulation or the wrong yeah. operating conditions or your simulation were not doing what you, what is typical to, for your application to happen in, in activity in your chip, then of course your results will be meaningless. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay, so this this was another aspect I wasn't wasn't thinking of at first. Is there anything else we do? Yeah, just that? like the typical things. Also, I don't know. Yeah, uh, no. So I mean, these are, these are probably the the typical things we cover. I, yeah, I would struggle to see many yes. other things. Yeah. You know, for so. example, I was looking at I was looking at the open source, you know, spice tools, mm -hmm. and then just do the you know the typical transient AC, yeah. and uh, this kind of stuff. But I was thinking back to like, hmm, in cadence, I did this, uh, you know, quasi periodic steady state and then, uh, yeah, want to be non linearity point and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but okay, that's so this is all, let's say, I'd classify all of that as standard spice, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, this, of course, we, we all do, and, and you just need to, to extract the, the rel relevant performance numbers. So of course you need to do a, like a periodic st steady state and a noise analysis to find out where in your design, like which transistor contributes how much noise and how how that reflects on your output signal. And then also to figure out what you can change about your t your design to make it better in terms of, of noise. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, of, of course, all these these sort of standard spice analysis are your, I guess your, your default tools when yeah. when you're a, a, an analog or, or custom designer um, yeah that was, that was kind of more curious like if there's any sort of <clears throat> more obscure simulations that you would use that 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 like the open source spice doesn't like typically have or require some python scripts to hack into it or something <laughs> Oh, I mean, a, a, a big part to, to talk about, and especially when it comes to the, the whole design and exploration phase, I found the, the tools I mean, lacking is, is maybe not the best word, but not, not very streamlined is uh, automation of these things, right? So a lot of mm -hmm. times I find myself, I would like to simulate in a parametric fashion, uh, different configurations of, uh, of cells, like sizes of transistors and these things um, to really get a view of the of the map I can use for optimization, right? So the, yeah. the, the landscape I'm kind of looking at, um, and I'm, while the tools will give you an optimizer, um, it it they they certainly become limited if you are planning to run like I don't know ten thousand simulations with five different open uh, parameters. So there you you resort to to scripting often, um, but. Okay, there's, there's a scripting interfaces for those as it I, essentially, uh, this is by simulators haven't in their core changed much from from what, what we probably all know being a command line tool that you can uh, feed a netlist that you can auto generate, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it comes down to you developing a bit of a, a wrapper around that generates all your input netlists and post processes the results. And probably they, they have more obscure, like, I don't know, harmonic balance, and all, all sorts of, of, let's say, special analysis types, which an open source simulator probably doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I, as mentioned, I'm not not analog designer by heart, so I'm, I'm not, I don't find myself using them often. I use the ones I, I need, right. then figure out how they work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but as I said, I mean, I also heavily profit from the fact that I mean, traditionally our, I mean, of course, the, the upbringing or the experience from many of our designers 
uh, that are my colleagues are, are is, is analog background in nature, right? Because many mm -hmm. of them, uh, and essentially either come from a time where digital design was not in the state it is today, uh, where it constitutes the majority of, of design done. Um, so they grew up with with the intricacies of spice simulations much more than than I probably did, yeah. Or our generation in general. Um, so then then they know the tricks and and they are of course there to to ask and help. So yeah, come comes down again to also knowing where to look because of course just just looking at the the documentation and them telling you what commands you have available is is not really telling you how to solve any given problem. Yeah. Um, and this this is probably the I, the, the hard thing I, I find about many aspects that there's just no, 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 not enough golden book recipes to, to do all these, these intricate things, right? Because so many of them are vendor dependent, tool dependent, yeah. but it, it's, it's not possible to write a single guide for how to, how to achieve what you want. Um, and many things just do come down to getting the experience, doing them once, figuring out where the pitfalls are, um, and then passing that on or, or applying it for yourself at least. Yeah, that's funny. Funny, like you know, in, 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 for software, there's like Stack Overflow. You just Google the thing, and right, for yeah. like SC design, it's like there's this weird forum, or you have to ask your colleagues, and that's about it. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's <laughs> the only only Edda board, which is I don't know, I, I which I typically don't find very helpful, and then yeah, mm. the, the, the kind of resources only end. But that I mean, it's probably just the nature of the thing because the community is so small. I mean, even though. And probably it is not it's big, but yeah. it is probably big, but it's it's also and it's very closed and and probably also compared to and the, the mindset is so different, right? With with software, yeah. it is just the default thing because people have always been just asking things on on Usenet or on the internet uh, about how to solve a given problem uh, because mm -hmm. probably they come from a time when there was no documentation. While in this world, like going to your vendor of choice is is the default option if you can't find the the, the solution. And you know you won't find people online that just tell you how to do this one obscure thing in this one obscure software you use. So. Yeah, I wonder if it like, will be like sort of a, a funny side effect of the open source tool that there grows more of this openness about it. But I, I do hope so, certainly. I know that yeah. would be something I would really appreciate because I find myself in this this situation often where I I I just like to Google something. I mean, that is, yeah. <laughs> so and of course the 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 it's it's not that the the, the tools of, of the vendors we use they don't lack the documentation, right? They have thousands of pages of manual. Mm -hmm. Um but that that doesn't replace so getting an answer to how to solve a problem. Yeah. Uh, that is a completely different thing. So of course t knowing how to use the tools and, and then what what first what what to do, right? To to solve any given challenge. It's not easy and, and also not really knowledge that comes from books in, in that sense, right? They will tell you what's important to look at, but also not how to achieve what is critical to, to simulate. Um, and, and this circles back a bit to, to what we did earlier. So this, this whole process of learning how to partition your design, how, what, what to include, what, what to take care of, what to pay attention to. This is something that yeah, at this point, I, I think only and for, for many, many, many parts of the design is really only experience that can teach you, but it, it probably, and it's not that it can't be done any other way. So I really look forward to the open source ecosystem, just adding onto that and adding like, a, I don't know, knowledge base wiki for these sorts of things uh, where just people or people will just generally document together with their designs, also how they approached solving a problem. And of course you might have people that just didn't attempt solving them because they were not aware, but you will also have those designs that actually did care and will hopefully then also share how they got to what they what they fabricated in the end, right? And then prove that it works and why it yeah. does. And because this is always the the part that I, I find so interesting that these all, like any given design, no matter how, how simple it is in, in an integrated world, typically contains just so much inbuilt knowledge that mm -hmm. you just can't read back from looking at the schematic or the, the layout. Um, because I mean, you can see how big each individual transistor is and where it is placed and how it's connected, but the process that led why, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to why it is the way it is and why this is the exact correct dimensions and why it can't be larger or smaller, uh, this is something I find very intriguing about the field, but of course, I mean, it doesn't need to be shrouded in this sort of secrecy. I mean, it would be much better for everyone involved if, if people were just attaching instructions, but of course, that's what we call intellectual property and people are not exactly keen on doing it. <laughs> uh, understandably, yeah. I'm sure it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. I think that's a nice positive note to end yeah. our yeah. <laughs> already hour long talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. so was uh, was interesting and uh, 
thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, was a pleasure, and yes. let's hope we he we hear from more people. I'm certainly looking forward to. So if this were to catch on as a series, I would like to. Yeah. Hear. I hope some other people will also tell me about yeah. their work. Will be fun. Yeah. Certainly hope so. Yeah. Let's okay. see what they can share. Okay. <laughs> thank you.